Welcome to the Summer Strand United Sunday Service Podcast. We hope you'll enjoy the service with us. For more information, visit summerstrandunited.co.za. Is it lovely to be in His presence, friends? Don't you want to just look around and see the people around you again and give thanks for them? And we've been alone and lonely in our little homes, doing our own little thing, and here we are. Is the year any good? Isn't God good and kind and gracious and loving? Yeah, and here we are. It's so lovely to see this team up here, hey? Weren't they a good lot to us today? Yeah. We weren't sure if we'd see them again, and here they are. Yeah, it's so lovely to see you. So lovely to see you again and uh, to know that um, the season is coming to an end. It will come to an end finally, won't it? It will finally come to an end. So children's and teen church is happening now. If you're a teener or you're a children, there you go. And there are some classes for you and some lovely folk to serve you, Nicola and Andre and the rest, um, to love you and to teach you about the things of Jesus and the kingdom of God. So the offering baskets, uh, they won't come around. Um, They are available in the foyer as you leave the church. And that's how we're doing the offering now. And we thank you for all your giving. We thank you for your online giving. We encourage that. But if you do bring to the church, then as you leave, uh, they're in the foyer. And thanks to the team that was helping in the foyer this morning. So we still are looking for some volunteers to assist um, with the welcome in, 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 at, at the church service. So if you're feeling courageous and you want to take temperatures or you want to write down some names or you want to sanitize some hands, then please do let us know. Uh, email Bianca or let me know. Gary, why don't you come and, uh, and pray for us and pray for the offering, even though it's still in some people's pockets, we do it by faith. <laughs> just, just encourage them to let it go, Gary. Go. They, thank you. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for the tithes and the offering, Lord Jesus. And yeah, we, in these uh, strange times, Lord Jesus, we're just so grateful that we could, we've got to give, Father God. And we know that it comes from you. And so we're just giving it back to you, Lord Jesus, for the furtherance of your kingdom. Father God, we pray for our town, our city. We pray for our country, our leaders. Lord Jesus, we just lift them all to you and just ask that you soften their hearts, Father God, and that they would praise and worship you, Lord Jesus. And yeah, we're just so grateful for everything we have. Your grace is so wonderful and so much, Father God. And uh, we're just privileged to, to be in a position, Father God, where you've just presided upon us. And so we give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. It's great to be back. As, as Murray said, wasn't too sure whether we were ever going to get back here. But it's wonderful to be back. And I know that the question that is on your mind is, uh, how's Benji? Um, Because I'm no longer important. um, And that's fine. I can deal with that. Uh, Benji's doing well. He's down in Cape Town. It's his first birthday this coming week. So Tara and Benji flew yesterday. um, And then I'm going to be flying down later today uh, to go celebrate his first birthday. He's walking around. um, He's saying mama, but I don't think he knows exactly what he's saying. And um, he's got a few teeth on him, and he's a wonderful little bubba. And um, so far, so good. He loves the ocean. So hopefully we can keep nurturing that. Well, it's wonderful to, to be back and to be back up here. And I, I hope that uh, as I get back up here, you are gracious, and I'm gracious with myself as we go on in this, in this journey. Well, this morning... The, our text is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Uh, we are in week 18 of our Sermon on the Mount. Week 18. Uh, I can't believe it's been that long, but it's been a wonderful journey, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I've, I've read it, and I've shared this with Murray. I've read the Sermon on the Mount quite a few times, but this has probably been the most special reading that I've had on the Sermon on the Mount, just forcing myself to go slowly through passages and rereading passages that maybe are very, very familiar to my mind and rereading it and getting into it a little bit more. And I think today's passage, for, at least for me especially, was one of those passages. And so if I had to just ask you, what is the most important thing in your house? It was a, it was a question that was given to me when I was in primary school a few years ago. 
down at Cape Town. Cape Town was on, on fire, you know those nice table, table mountain fires, and it was raining down ash in our garden, and my mom came to me and said, you know what, if we have to leave the house, what do you want to bring with you? I, I think my top list up there was Lego. We had a nice Lego box. But it, it's a good clarifying question. What is the most important thing in your house? What's the most important thing in your life? It, is, it shows our heart and, and maybe even our character. And, and this question, I'm not going to be bringing it up again, but it, uh, it, I'm wanting it to be in the front and center of our minds as we go into the, the, the sermon on Matthew chapter 7, verse 12 of self-care in other care, as we go into continuing shaping our lives in this changing world. Because Jesus goes straight for what is most important, as we look at our self-care in our other care. And so Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, we're going to read it, and then we're going to pray. And it could be up on, yes, it is up there. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Father God, we thank you that you are a loving Father. You are a gracious God, and you are an everlasting, all-powerful Father. So Father, we pray for this morning. We pray once more for your Holy Spirit to have his way in our lives. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. Help us to be malleable clay that the Father God can use to shape and reform. We pray this in your most holy and glorious name. Amen. So what is this passage commonly known as? Anyone want to help me out? What is this passage commonly known as? The Attitudes? Yeah, as far as I'm aware, this, this, this passage is commonly known as the Golden Rule. The golden rule in, in life, the golden rule in how we treat others. But this term golden rule, is not, it's not found in Scripture, but it is the, the popular way of referring to Jesus' words here in Matthew chapter 7 and in the, the repeat of that in Luke chapter 6. And it's given this title of golden rule because of its central role in our ethics. And also, it sums up the law and the prophets. And so let's just get into this. And One one writer rewrites verse 12 of Matthew chapter 7 this way. Do not treat your neighbor with anything less than genuine love. For you yourself would not want to have him treat you with anything else less than genuine love. And around the time of Jesus and before Jesus and after Jesus, this idiom, this This golden rule of treat others as you would have them treat you has been around. It has been around, but if according to uh, some of the scholars who are a lot more intelligent than me, all the other, all the other world religions and figures who have said this have said it in the negative, which leads to the possibility of well, I'm just not going to do anything. But Jesus doesn't give us that requirement. He puts it in the positive, and gives us the mandate to treat others as we would have them treat ourselves. It's a positive, active self-care and other care. And so how do, we, how do we do this? How do we, in everything, do to others what they would have them do to us? And how is this going to fulfill the law and the prophets? Well, let's, let's dive into our, our Bibles. I've, I've got a few passages as we're going to be going through and some of them I'm going to read, some of them I'm going to refer to. Uh, I'm not expecting you to get there fast, but if you do have a quick hand, you're more than welcome to, to get there. But we're going to just be diving into some of the passages of the Bible and see how that may help us understand this passage. So as we, as we look at popular culture today, I think it would be, seem fitting that as I read this, they, they might say, well, we can do this on our own strength. We can take care of ourselves and love other people on our own strength and our own being. But this doesn't take into consideration our reality. If I had to genuinely reflect on my own life, I very rarely treat other people the same way that I would want them to treat me. And 
then it also takes into the, doesn't take into consideration the, the, the actual context. Murray's sermon last week on the, the ask, seeking, and knocking, it doesn't take into consideration that, and then doesn't take into consideration, Alan's, Alan, you are next week, right? Yeah, Alan's sermon next week on the narrow road and the far and the big highway. And it doesn't take into consideration the whole narrative of the Bible. Scripture is clear that apart from the working of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives, obedience, even in principle, upon which God's approval can rest fully, is impossible. And I, I found this an awesome cross-reference. In, in Matthew chapter 7, it, the, the verse just before, in verse 11, it says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven Give good gifts to those who ask him. So that Matthew says good gifts. Well, in Luke's account of this preceding verse, in Luke eleven thirteen, he says this, If then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Holy Spirit is a prerequisite of us doing to others what we would have them do to us. Because we cannot do it on our own strength. I cannot do this on my own strength. I need the Holy Spirit desperately in treating others with the kind of love that I expect and desire. And in fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, the Golden Rule, as I said, is preceded by this lengthy discourse in which Jesus, by clear implication, teaches us to love God above all. And this implies this inner devotion of our hearts to God and undivided trust in Him amid, amid all circumstances. So friends, are you trusting God this morning? As you woke up this morning, whether you looked at the news or not, as you went through this week, are we, are we trusting God in all the circumstances in life? And in light of that, our attitude toward our Heavenly Father as children of God are exhorted to love our neighbor, whom God also created in his image. It's amazing that Jesus taught this 2,000 years ago, and no one has been able to top it since. No one has been able to top the ethics and the, the, the style of teaching that Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. It's a, it's a wonderful, life-changing passage. And then with regard to the Old Testament, two points prevail. Well, well, Matthew says that if you love your neighbor as you love yourself, you are fulfilling the law and the prophets. So I did a little bit of a Google search because I'm not going to sit there and count. But apparently there are 600 and 22,700 words in the Old Testament. That's a lot of words. And there are 613 laws. And all of that is summed up in loving our neighbor. All of that is summed up in loving our neighbor. And secondly, even though the golden rule here addresses our interrelationship, how we treat one another, it cannot be taken away from our first standing, and that is with God. In Matthew chapter 22, a little bit further on in the gospel, it serves as kind of the, the bridge to this hermeneutical law of the golden rule where the, the, disciples, uh, the disciples ask Jesus, what is the most important commandment? And Jesus says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which is the Shema, which comes from the Old Testament law. And as a result of that, to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says the greatest commandment, singular, is to love God and to love your neighbor. It, they are connected. We cannot truly love our neighbor if we do not truly love God. And we cannot truly love God if we do not truly love our neighbor. The two are intertwined and perfectly combined. And so adherence to the, the Shema, the the Deuteronomy 6, and in, in the Exodus, the, the, the Ten Commandments, and obeying the mandate to love one's neighbor is essentially conveyed in this golden rule. And so 
Yes, we are to do this, but we cannot do this in our own strength, and we cannot do this without the help of our loving Father. And in the New Testament, it paints this awesome canvas of this truth. In Romans chapter 13, uh, verses 8 to 10, it reads like this. Owe no, owe no one anything. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall, not, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And hear this, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Paul also says in Galatians chapter 5, For you were called to freedom. You were called to freedom. Only do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, Serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out. If you are not consumed by one another. And so going back to this golden rule, so-called golden rule in Matthew chapter 7. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. To bring a little bit of textual commentary to a close, I, I love this summary of what we are dealing with today. And, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it. It comes from a, a, a commentator. And it, it's as if Jesus' words are to say, How much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, that is, out of gratitude for the Father's continuing gifts, you should love your neighbors as you desire that they love you, in order that the stream of love toward the undeserving may flow on and on, not only to our hearts, but also through and from your hearts until it reaches even the most unworthy. Thus, indeed, you will be sons of your Father who is in heaven, who causes his son to rise on people, evil and good, and sends rain on righteous and unrighteous. And this indeed alone is the golden rule. And so how on earth are we going to do this? How are we going to love God? And how are we going to love those around us? Well, I, I'm going to offer a, a very simple, basic framework, and this is not exhaustive, but I think if we practice these two things, I think we could go a far way in practicing and implementing the golden rule in our lives of loving the Father and loving each other. And the first one is respond to the Father's love. One of the questions that I get in youth ministry is, how do I know God loves me? You know, have I lost his love? Well, we got amazing passages in the Bible that speak of God's love and His unfailing love and His unending love and even His love for us from before the foundation of the world. It is a, it is a very bizarre thought if you read the Bible and take it at face value to wonder whether God loves you. It doesn't fit. God loves us. He is a Father who loves us. And it is our response to respond to this Father's love in obedience and faith. And this is the underlying premise of the golden rule and the, the reason why we love. The reason why we love one another is because of a response and an overflowing of the love that God has put in our hearts. But maybe, why would I want to have this Father's love. You don't know my Father. I haven't really had a great example of fatherly love in this world. Maybe my experience of this idea of a father is horrific. Maybe it's been absent. Maybe it's even been wonderful. 
But I know with a surety that the Father's love for us is 100% genuine. When in Revelation chapter 21, we have this imagery of the Father wiping away every tear from our eyes. There is a, an intimate, loving, personal Father who is far above our earthy fathers, whether they are horrific, absent, or wonderful. We have an earthy father who is there and loves us. And so we are to respond to the father's love. The wonderful gospel, the gospel of grace, the gospel that is so wonderful that a, a child can understand it, we can understand it in an instant, and we can spend our entire lives never getting to the depths of the world of God's grace. The depths of the world of God's grace. It is, it is unfathomable. It is wonderful. And we get to respond to this love. And so if we respond to God's love, we are on the good stead to loving one another. Secondly, we are to practice a healthy biblical self-care. And this is the measure at which we are to love. And Jesus seems to assume here that we don't have a, a, a pathological desire to harm ourselves. And I, I think if we had to ask ourselves that question, I think that is true of us. We don't, want, we don't want other people to harm ourselves. And he wants, he wants us to consider how we self-care and consider how then we get to hand that out to other people. So what is this self-care? Well, maybe some red lights are flashing. Maybe we either on the, the stoic side of, of uh, self-degradation where we just should hang our heads low in shame because we are unrighteous, filthy sinners. Or maybe we should be on the other side and say, well, uh, we, we should be taking care of ourselves because we are the center of the universe. We are the most important thing. We, as in I. Um, the most important thing. And uh, I'd like us to be somewhere in the middle here. And as we look through the, the life of Jesus, with a self-care enables us to hold our heads high as we approach the throne of grace. We are sinful yet loved, imperfect yet the pinnacle of creation. And in Jesus' life, all through the Gospels, it's been a wonderful journey reading through the Gospels. In, a, in our office devotions, we first read through Matthew. We read, from, read through Matthew for, I think, about two years. And now we're reading through Luke. And it's just been a wonderful time just to reread the Gospels and, and watch Jesus' life over and over again. And, and Jesus, before he was able to love other people, he retreated to go and love with the Father. He lived in the presence of his Father. Jesus desired his heavenly Father. And in response to their loving relationship, God the Father's loving relationship, he, he wanted those around him to experience that same kind of love. And so in our own self-care, how much time are we taking aside to be with God? How much time are we taking to be with God. If we are battling to love someone else, be it a spouse, a child, a co-worker, a stranger, taxis, whatever it may be in our lives, how much time are we spending with God to help us with that? Or are we just being involved and revolving around that hurt? Because, friends, if we are not spending time with God, if we not, do not reflect Jesus' practice of being with the Father, well, this is just not going to get sorted out. And so what do you think church, marriage, work, put any other word in that, if this golden rule is practiced, where everyone seeks the Father, and has responded in His love, and as a result of that, loves each other. Wouldn't that be a place we would all want to be? That would be a place that I would want to be, and that would be here, 
in a workspace with our friends. And one day we're going to experience it in heaven, in its perfection. And so the most important thing, this golden rule, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. We get to remember the Lord's love for us as we come and celebrate communion, as we come and partake in communion, whether you've got your own little kit or come and get some from the front. Communion is an awesome and phenomenal reminder of God's love for us, that he broke his body for us, that he took a punishment upon his body for us that we could not bear, and he took the, the cup of God's wrath for us. Friends, this morning, if we are wondering, does the Father even know I am here? Does the Father know who I am, what I'm going through? Does the Father love me? Have I lost his love? Have I done something that has eradicated his love? No, he hasn't. He loves you. Remember that as we take communion. And as a result of that, as we naturally fall in love with God, while the rest will fall into place, we will start loving other people around us. If I had to close with this, let us not strive to love one another. Let us strive to love God above all, and we will naturally love one another. Let us strive to love God more and more, to fall in love with Him more and more. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your love for us, your kindness towards us. Lord, when your grace and kindness was revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this undeserving grace in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you, that you use people like us, broken jars of clay, and remold us. And that we get to approach the throne of grace with confidence, knowing that we are loved by you, that we are sinful yet forgiven, imperfect yet the pinnacle of creation. Help us, Lord Jesus, to fall in love with you, to comprehend with all the saints how wide and deep your love is for us and to give us strength to comprehend this love. And as a natural result, flow love through our hearts and our lives to those around us, even unto our enemies. Lord, we pray that you open our hearts, open our minds as we come and remember what you did for us in communion. Amen. So, Father, we're so grateful to be able to worship together. We have sung words of truth, and our, and our souls have responded. And now, Lord, we have been nourished by your word. Isn't it so true, friends, that Jesus is the bread of life? And when we read his word and we let his word sink into our souls, we find ourselves being nourished. We find uh, a parched soul being once again, the river of life coming to protect us and fill us and, and help us and guide us. And where we're, we're dry and dusty, we find the breath of the Holy Spirit coming over us. And Father, we, we just love your word. We love the truth that it speaks to us. And Lord, we, we're, we're aware today that we have not loved you as you have invited us to. We have not rushed into your presence. We have, we have rushed out into the world with with criticism and struggle and pain and hurt and we've where we've been hurt we've carried that hurt over to others and Lord we come today to say we're sorry uh, as Rob has said this is uh, the golden rule influences every aspect of our lives and we pray Lord Jesus that in those primary relationships of between spouses between mums and dads and grandparents and children and parents and loved ones and friends lord we would 
we would show this beautiful golden rule. And Lord Jesus, as we gather around this table, we are aware that there is none who has loved us like you have. For on the cross, Lord, you, you took our insults, our shame, you took you know, our, our abandonment, our running away, our, our fear, our anxiety, you took it all. And so, Lord, we also come to say that we love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Friends, won't you come to him today with, with the fullness of your heart or the emptiness of your soul? Won't you just come and run to him? For, for all who know him and love him, this table is a, is a friendly, welcoming table. It's a table of grace. here we are forgiven and we are accepted and here we are reshaped by the father's love so if your marriage is struggling if your friendships are struggling this is the table for you it's the table for me and it's also this table where we we learn this healthy biblical love that we are loved and we are cherished by god and isn't it true friends when are we're struggling with our relationships our own heart struggles when we hurt our spouse we hurt ourselves when we hurt our friends we hurt ourselves when we hurt our children we hurt ourselves when our words are unkind we're being unkind to ourselves when we withhold love to another we withhold love to ourselves and so let's sing together that beautiful ancient prayer that that uh, jesus invites us to pray all the time that seeks to honor God and seeks to guide us in temptation and seeks to replenish us as we forgive ourselves and forgive others. For let's forgive ourselves today as well as we sing this lovely prayer. Our Father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come you are the eternal one the holy one as we've heard today that day will come when we will be with you in heaven and there you will wipe away every tear every struggle every pain and death is taken care of and evil is taken care of and there's no more temptation don't you look forward to that day friends that day one day and as we gather around this table we remember that one day that jesus is returning and he will come in all glory and power and wonder and strength and so on the night that he was betrayed he took bread and he broke it and he said this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me and so too after supper he took the cup which is the cup of the new covenant he said which is poured out in my blood and each time you drink of this cup or you eat this bread you are remembering we are remembering that the lord will return and he will come and fetch us. Could you say amen to that, friends? That he's returning to come and fetch us to be with himself in his perfect time. And so now, as we eat together, as we take the bread, and so uh, if you've brought your bread with you, then won't you open your little container and your little picnic? 
Die van jullie know wat onthou het, of you remember it. Otherwise, there is bread here. So, um, perhaps it would be good for those who you, you don't have, and we understand you don't have, because you may not have been here last week. Or, so then you're welcome to come and fetch a, a piece of bread and uh, some juice. Would, you, would anyone like to do that? You're very, very welcome. Maybe we can just sit together and then we'll we'll take the bread together. Um, sorry, back back in your back in your places. We'll take the bread and then we'll take the juice. <laughs> 